This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace. Turn your idea into a new website. Go to squarespace.com slash twist for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use offer code twist to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Fiverr. Find the perfect freelance services for your business. Go to fiverr.com and use code twist to receive 10% off your first order. And Masterclass. Learn from the world's best minds. Anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. Get 15% off an annual membership at masterclass.com slash startups. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. I'm super excited to have our next guest on because George Arison uh, is the founder of Shift shift.com. We're going to talk about that and the company uh, going public via a SPAC. There's been a lot of spectacular companies going public. And we're going to talk about the whole SPAC movement, which everybody's very interested in. But in addition, George created Uber years before Uber existed or Lyft with something called Taxi Magic. So we're going to get into the history of that and what it's like as a founder to create a game-changing company, but not win the big prize. Welcome to the pod, George Arison. And I'm pronouncing it correct. It's Arison, A-R-I-S-O-N, correct? That's correct. And thanks for having me. Excited to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I let off with it. It's got to be an interesting moment. A lot of your friends probably bring this up and family members. You created Taxi Magic, which, if my memory serves me correct, was a way to get a taxi and have it dispatched. Uh, sounds very familiar to me. And you did that back in 2007, which was a couple of years before Uber existed, correct? Yeah, we uh, started Taxi Magic in February of 2007 and, um, you know, launched it uh, as a product first on the East Coast and then in San Francisco as well. You could book a taxi to come to you through your phone. At this point, it was a BlackBerry and a uh, you know, Palm device, Windows Mobile. iPhone did not yet exist. Uh, and then you could also pay for the taxi through the phone as well, all connected to the dispatch systems at the taxi fleets. Which I was, didn't realize you also had payments because yeah. that was Uber's uh, and Lyft's big innovation as well. But you did it with taxis, not with Lincoln Town Cars. Take me back to that decision to do taxis and not Lincoln Town Cars. Yeah, so we, um, I mean, we actually did Lincoln Town Cars in New York, but the thinking was we wanted to appeal to the broadest segment of the population and taxis made a lot of sense. The concept for the business came out of B2B use, actually. It was for business travelers first, and they would not want black cars, right? The travel manager would want to limit what you spend, and the idea was to kind of have you do taxis rather than black yes. cars. That was kind of part of the concept. Um, and, you know, we we came up with a lot of great tech and my co-founder and now my co-CEO at Shift, um, Toby Russell, calls it the you know Netscape of the uh, automotive on-demand space because we came up with a product and then obviously others won, uh, which mm -hmm. is fine. We still learned a ton and it was a really great experience. But for us, the really big uh, kind of challenge came when um, Lehman Brothers went under, actually, because we uh, Lehman Brothers was going to be our first uh, New York customer. Uh, with all the black cars in New York kind of using right. our tech to, to do the pickup from the bank and take you home at night um, product, uh, which was very popular. You know, you, back in the day, a lot of black cars were circling uh, the banks uh, to pick people up. Yeah, if you lived and in New York, you saw uh, down from any major high price building, Class A office space, whether it was Goldman Sachs or, yeah. you know... Um, a uh, famous law firm or Sherman Sterling or something, there would just be tons and tons of Lincoln Town Car circling to take people yep. home for a hundred bucks a pop to Brooklyn. Exactly. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. And so we guys. were going to be managing that for for Lehman Brothers, and then of, like literally, Parkslow. we signed the contract to do that about two weeks before they went under. Wow. Um, so that really kind of messed the New York plan up. But we were going to do black cars in a much more aggressive way, in addition to taxis in New York in particular. Um, but, you know, I think the really big problem for us was the fact that we never gave a product away for free. Um, ah. Like the, the team uh, at its core, and in particular, our co-founder, um, Tom DePasquale, who's a super amazing uh, businessman, but he had done a bunch of enterprise businesses. And mm. so he really believed in the notion that, hey, you got to charge 
um, for everything right off the bat. Wow. And that was a, a mistake that we made. We should have gone freemium, offer the product for free, yep. gotten a bunch of users, and then kind of- So um, that throttled your growth because people didn't even exactly. know you existed. And the only way they would know you existed if they gave you money. So there's a exactly. huge lesson yeah. learned. Exactly. And, and then, then what's it? What's it? Okay, continue. Here's the really crazy part. So um, Bill Gurley found us. Yeah. Um, through um, Michael, uh, sorry, through Adam Dell, Michael Dell's brother. Of course, um, I knew Adam when I lived in New York. I'd see him at Bungalow yeah. 8 at 3 so, in the morning. Yeah. So he found us and then he uh, told Bill Gurley about it. Bill wow. Gurley kind of started to get really interested. This is all like way before Uber is even around. And um, she really wanted to do a, a round of funding and shift. And uh, ultimately, Tom, our you know leader as Wait, a founder- no, in and so um, in, 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 in uh, Taxi Magic, Taxi and, Magic. Uh, Tom really didn't want to do that because he, um, uh, you know, he, 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 they disagreed on this kind of consumer freemium versus enterprise wow. ap approach. So, uh, you know, we, so it's even of, worse than not hitting it. You literally have the guy who did yeah. the Series A and Uber would have given you the money. One of the 10 greatest venture capitalists in yep. the history of venture capital was on your doorstep. And because of your co-founder not agreeing with him about something Bill Gurley was clearly right about, and yep. you well, understand now, it I killed the deal. I was kind of in the middle between the Yes, that's exactly right. And it was a, oh you know, God. probably cost me personally like hundreds of millions of dollars. No, and, no, and, billions. And, and, and maybe billions. Yes. Well, you were a co-founder of the company? <laughs> yeah, yes. So, I mean, I mean, if you're a co-founder with 10%, Uber's worth $65 billion right now, I'm going to say even if you got diluted down to 2%, you would be worth $1.2 billion right now. So it was a oh my tough, Lord. tough, tough process. But anyway, oh you know, look, I- uh, You know what? I think about that sometimes because I could have put 50K instead of 25K into Uber. And then you know what I did? I looked myself in the mirror and said, don't get greedy. Get back yep. to work. That, that, don't worry. Don't sweat the small stuff. I, I agree. And look, I think um, I learned a ton of Taxi Magic and we built a great company, uh, even though we made oh. a ton of mistakes. And, uh, you know, I'm taking a lot of those then, learnings and doing things differently now. Everybody who you know says you could have built Uber. What's that like at Christmas or whatever, you know, New Year's Eve? That, was asked, that was asked a lot more back oh, in the day before gotcha. the kind of yeah. shift was, you know, fully humming. Today, not that many people ask that anymore. Um, I think for us, to be honest, uh, beyond that specific mistake, not being in, in the valley uh, got in the way as well because oh. we were based in Virginia and um, that really kind of the mentality of like enterprise only don't give away for free, et cetera, back then was very much like only in Silicon Valley was that a thing. So you, uh, the people, you weren't bold, it, basically yeah. East coast companies at the time were very conservative. They yes. were think, and the VCs on the East coast with some notable exceptions like Fred Wilson were so, uh, exactly. obsessed with downside protection and not losing their money that they didn't swing for the fences. Did they? Yep, that's exactly right. So I think that, you know, kind of mm. even before Gurley, like we should have thought about moving the company out to San Francisco and or mm. Bay Area broadly and, and doing it he here. Actually, that's why I, after Taxi Magic, uh, my green card was rejected while I was at Taxi Magic. So I had to figure out oh. another way to stay in the US. Uh, and and I you decided, were from Georgia, uh, the I, former, yeah. was that a former part of the USSR? Yeah, it's the former USSR Republic uh, called Georgia. Yeah, and then you immigrated to America or Canada? Uh, no, so uh, in 1992, uh, well, in 1991, I applied to prep schools and got into a, a couple of U.S. prep schools. Wow. I was the first Soviet kid that they allowed to leave to go to a U.S. private school. Uh, but What, what time, time I, frame was that? Was that late 80s, early 90s? No, like, like 1991. Wow. Um, and then by so the, the Cold I, War is just ending. Exactly. And by the time I got to the U.S., like by the time the it was time for me to come to school. So the union had already fallen apart um, mm. and Georgia had become an independent country. So I lived in Maine uh, for four years for prep school. So wow. not quite Canada, but, you know, felt like you were in Canada in terms of cold. Um, and then, the I'm just curious, how did your students look at you? Did they think this, you're a Russian spy or you're part I of the Cold asking. War effort? Did, <laughs> were, were, was there like a... Well, I was, were people cautious around you, I guess is the way I, I would say it? I was pretty fortunate because I spoke English really well. Yeah. Uh, so my dad was a little bit insane uh, when I was little, and he forced me to study <laughs> English studying at age two. Um, so I was like not quite fluent, but like pretty close to fluent. What, what, what uh, led him to do that? My dad, um, who had you know, never been to the West, uh, had this really strong view that the Soviet Union is going to fall apart. 
uh, and if you don't speak English, you will not be able to wow. escape. And so his children were going to learn English and escape. And so you know, he might have been insane, but he was right, and he, he was did a huge right. mitzvah for you. Yep, uh, look, he I mean, basically saved your life. You could have been stuck there, and you didn't know how, if you didn't know how to speak English, you would have never had the chance to not become a billionaire with Uber or not create your second company. Take all those lessons when we get back. Let's hear all about Shift.com when we get back on this week in startups. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. With Squarespace, you already know that you can blog and publish content as you like. You can promote your business, announce upcoming events, do special projects like I do all the time. And of course, you can sell products and services of any kind because they've added all that e-commerce functionality to Squarespace's gorgeous easy to use designs, uh, and they have amazing, beautiful templates done by professional world-class designers. So your website looks like you spent $250,000 on it, not just $25 a month. They have this incredible e-commerce functionality that I've talked about, and everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box. So if somebody's got a gigantic phone or a tablet or anything in between, a desktop, a laptop, it's all responsive, beautiful, elegant design that's been tested over and over and over again to be perfect. That's the beauty of investing in a Squarespace website is that they keep adding features, but they keep the price the same. And we did remote demo day. I asked my team quite effervescently, get me a website right now for remotedemoday.com. We need to fund companies during a pandemic and bing, bang, boom, zip, zip, zip. It was up and running in just you know under a day and thank you that was us writing copy so here's what i want you to do i want you to go to squarespace.com twist for a free trial and when you're ready to launch your website i want to make sure you use the promo code twist you have to use the promo code twist and then you get that 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or domain as you know squarespace has been supporting this podcast i think for close to a decade they've been with me from the beginning they've been on the podcast they've supported everything i've done and i really appreciate it to the team at squarespace what a great product what a great solution what a great team congratulations on all your success by the way and if you're out there and you're looking to build a project to do e-commerce special project event blog whatever it is you know what to do Go to squarespace.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups, where I have the distinct pleasure of talking with founders. And because I'm a fellow founder, and because I got a lot of scar tissue, and because I'm not a gotcha journalist, I can sit with somebody like George Arison, and he trusts me, and he'll be honest with me, and we'll have a great conversation. And this has already started out as a great conversation. You were very honest about uh, the taxi uh, magic. Um, miss and getting here into america what, wow what a great story um but you lost your green card and then you you somehow figured out how to stay in america yeah, well I, so i didn't get my green card up yeah. while i was at text magic yeah. end up eventually joining google um moving to the west coast and to palo alto and i've been here ever since now it's been 10 years wow. and um, you worked on fiber at google you worked on their fiber project that was one of the, this was the first thing i worked on and so then really? i actually met minnie ingersoll who is my co-founder at shift uh, on that project she was my boss and then uh, we we started shifting was larry up. driving that project or sergey i know one of the two was obsessive I think, about um, it i think both actually both were. of them were obsessing uh, yeah. about it by the time i got to google the project was really far along so yeah. the whole you know t towns applying or cities applying to be part of the test had already happened we we're actually just kind of working on city selection and what the product would be in, in actuality because um you know that was really critical but i joined let's say late into the project already happening they were thinking very i remember talking to either i can't remember if it was lara or sergey but like during that time period i had talked to one of them about it and they were like yeah jay we're jay cow we're we're literally figuring out how to use hardcore equipment to rip up parking lots to put fiber in and figuring out how to do and i was like what and they're like yeah it's this thing first principles elon talks about and i was like okay explain and they're like yeah you know like the first principles we have to be able to get fiber underground so we're we're literally in the backyard of Google and he was t he was telling me at Google he had one of those machines that rips yes. up the earth. Yeah, yeah. And like either Sergey or Larry was like driving the machine trying to figure out how it worked to rip up the earth. This is a true story, correct? No, it's a hundred percent true. <laughs> and I think the goal was to try to force the traditional telecom providers um, to be have faster internet, right? And that's mm. actually happened. So you can look at Google Fiber as well, like did it fully succeed? It didn't 
in some people's eyes, it didn't get there. But from the perspective of what really mattered, which was to have better internet for consumers broadly, uh, very much actually happened. Ah, and I, I had written about that at a time. In a way, it was like a short, a shot across the bow to the telecom companies. If you're exactly. not going to increase the speed of cable modems, DSL, well, we have unlimited capital and we have a money printing machine at Google. Maybe we'll start just, well, pick a couple towns and maybe a couple towns becomes a couple cities and let's see what happens. And it did push people to go faster. That's exactly right. So tell, tell everybody in the audience, what is shift.com? Shift is a way to buy and sell a car. So if you have a car to sell, you come to shift.com, submit your car info, we price it for you, and then we buy it from you and take it away. Uh, and if you want to buy a car, you come find the car you'd like, and then click on a button, uh, book a test drive, and it shows up at your house. Uh, or you can buy a car um, on the site itself and then have it be shipped to you, um, and then it's yours. And, and how do people do this? How did people do this beforehand? They went to a used car lot or they tried to find some random stranger and get them to meet them in a parking lot at McDonald's or something? Yeah. So the US car market in the US is massive. It's $850 billion and it's split about 50 50 between private party sales, where like you and I meet up and, and sell a car to each other, which uh, is dangerous or, and insane. Correct. But it's about 15 million transactions a year. <laughs> what? Um, 15 million cars trade hands a year? person that, to person yeah. and 30 million overall yep and well 30 million on top of that is uh dealer sales oh. half of those dealer sales are auction sales so th this is where they sell a car to another dealer at an auction oh i see uh, and another 15 million is, is sales directly to consumer so there's a there's close to 50 million used cars getting sold in the yeah, united it's, states it's 40 a year. to 40 to 50 a year depending wow. on the year so that means i mean there's 330 million folks in america 70 million of them would be kids so that means like one in four adults or one in five adults is buying a used car a year. Um, so on average, an American household changes the car every three years. Because on average, they have more than two cars. But even if you assume two cars, mm. they kind of move through cars every six years or so. Wow. Um, and every time you buy a new car, like a brand new car, something has to happen with a used car as well, right? So there's a lot of trade-ins yep. and, and then those are sold, et cetera. But it's a, it's a mass. I mean... Cars in general are, are a huge market. Used cars are the largest retail market in the US. And, and even though the vehicle itself has been completely changed by technology, um, even though the, you know, how it's configured is very different and, and it's become a computer, technology hasn't really touched the sales process that much mm. until about you know, six, seven years ago when Shift plus a couple of companies really started to go after it from the digital perspective and try to bring e-commerce to car sales. And so is the major innovation in your model that you buy the cars themselves, clean them up, and then have the inventory there? Well, dealers do that too, right? Dealers yeah. buy the car and then it's, it's trying to bring it online is the one major innovation. Number two is kind of putting the entire purchase process into the control of the consumer. So a customer can apply for financing on their own, on our website, get approval, finish the transaction, right? That's really easy. And then thirdly, the real magic for us is the test drive delivered to the customer. Where instead of you having to go to the, to the store, i.e. to the dealership to see the car, the car shows up on your doorstep, and then you can try it out and see if you want to buy it, and then you know, either buy or send it back. I, I noticed you have um, a bunch of Teslas on the website. I was just looking at it now. Are, th are those easier to sell or harder because so many, I know they're in demand, but I know that Tesla makes it really easy. I just traded in my Model 3. So is, is that a hard market to be in the EV market or the Tesla market specifically? So and how have they impacted e the sort of used sales? EVs the, the car and issue? hybrids are, are yeah. very popular on our website because we have, mm. California is a huge portion of our sales. And so in California, they're very popular. We used to actually not sell Teslas at all because pricing them was a little bit difficult. Uh, but now there are enough used Teslas in the market where you can actually be certain about the price and we started to sell them again. Um, generally, they take a little bit longer to sell, um, but we do very well on them from the gross profit perspective. So um, that's why we do them. Uh, and, and on the consumer side, they just come to the website, they see a Jeep Wrangler they want, and they can just set a test drive. And then who, who brings the car to them? Um, you, so we your have, employees? Yeah, we have a team of uh, employees that, that are called concierges, and, and ah. they are full-time W-2 employees, and they bring the car to you. They are not car experts, so they're not meant to like know a ton about the car. They're meant to drive the car to you and be really good at customer service. Um, and then we have a sales team that's on the phone. So if you have a kind of more complicated car questions, you go to the sales team with that.
Got it. So this could be like a college kid or something getting paid 20 right. bucks an hour to Perfect. just drive the car to you. Yep. And that creates whatever, 50 to 100 bucks in cost for per test drive for you. Something yes. in that range, I would guess. Yeah, that's enough money. Uh, okay, just guessing. I'm, I just did 20 bucks an hour times <laughs> whatever number of hours. Pretty easy to do the math. But just that step alone that I'm not putting myself in harm's way with some random person. Uh, you know, I remember when I got married and with my wife, she was going to sell one of her cars. And I was like, she's like, I keep getting harassed. My wife's beautiful. And she kept getting harassed every time she was trying. I said, that's enough. No more of you selling the cars. I'm going to handle this. Uh, because the, every guy who came to see the car started hitting on her. And then they'd have her mobile numbers or texting her and ask yep. if they want to have dinner. And I was like, well, this is unacceptable. Um, that's a big part of it. It's like scary to meet people in parking lots. No. And I mean, many, actually, my one of my co-founders, she had this very same experience. Right? She had a BMW she went to sell. She had people show up at her house. They're like, can I Oof. go drive it? And like, do I get in the car with this person or do I like wait for them? And if I wait for them, they might steal the car. If I get in the car with them, who knows what they do while yeah. I'm in the car with them. So there is a huge kind of factor there. Craigslist is a massive portion of the sales, um, which is still kind of crazy when you think about it, but about 7 million cars peer to peer sold through Craigslist um, mm -hmm. a year. But, uh, you know, us, Carvana, Vroom are all kind of trying to change that. And, and the complexity of this market is that it's a huge market. So no one company can kind of capture all the market. You know, CarMax is the largest used car seller in the US, and they are barely over 1% market share. Wow. So, so this is uh, a lot of work. And what about, you know, the thing I always hear about, uh, and you know, they make Sopranos episodes about is there's a big market overseas for the used cars in the United States. Is that true? And if so, do you do that as well, where you just buy, you know, 100 Priuses and send them to South America or Russia? We don't touch that. Uh, so we will make an offer for any car from a seller. So even if it's a 15 year old car, we'll still make an offer for it, even Why? though we, we will not sell that car to another consumer. We'll then take that car to auction. Someone uh, will buy that car to auction, and that's the car that goes shipped. So you'll buy any car. car. That's kind of we like buy we'll any buy car. any car is like Correct. the the slogan, uh, yes. and that's because you get to pick the price, right? So you could Correct. you could do a, yeah, a low so, offer. So for cars that say are eight years old or two years old or ten years old, we'll give you a, what we call a retail price. Because mm. we'll sell that car to another consumer. But for cars that are over 10 years old, oftentimes we'll give you a wholesale price, which will be lower, but we'll still be able to at least help you get rid of the car. So you can um, get rid of the car same day or same correct. week or something like that, which is like, uh, they used to always have this, like when I was in New York, these tele these radio commercials, you probably remember, cars for cash, get your car here, you get yes. But you knew you were going to get like, if it was a $10,000 used car, you were gonna, they were going to offer you 7500 you were going to get screwed. Yep. Um, and, and we try to, I mean, our prices are generally above where a dealer would offer you if you traded a car in, because mm -hmm. um, our concept isn't to be, um, you know, we want to be fair to the seller, fair to the buyer, um, and then, you know, use technology to drive the cost of the operation down Got so it. that we can actually do it at a lower lower cost. All right, when we get back from this break, I want to know the economics. If I was selling a $10,000 used car, how much would you make? How much does the seller make, et cetera? Um, and then I also want to know... Why did you choose to go down the SPAC path when there is unlimited amounts of venture capital sitting around in the market? When we get back on this week at Startups. The way we work together has changed overnight. And if there's one thing we've learned, it's having access to the right resources is essential for adapting your business. Finding the right talent can be time consuming. It's super frustrating. It's expensive. And that's where Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R, -E can help. Fiverr's marketplace connects businesses with freelancers, and it does it for dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of services, graphic design, copywriting, web programming, film editing, et cetera. Also data normalization. So here's something I did. I wanted to meet more founders in Australia because we were doing the launch festival there. I hired somebody on Fiverr. I said, find me, make me a little spreadsheet here, a little CRM, if you will, of every CEO and founder, every angel investor, and every single accelerator, incubator in Australia, because I'm coming to town. And you know what I did? We then researched them and we invited them to come to the conference for free. Would you like a free ticket? Click here. I I'm embarrassed to say how easy this was to do. This would have cost I, I kid you not, a thousand times what it cost on Fiverr to market, whether you're launching your first business or scaling your current one or you need extra support, Fiverr is there to help. 
and they have great customer service 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you know what you're paying up front. There's no negotiations and people live and die by those reviews. So they really, uh, there's such a great incentive in the system to please you and to solve your problem. They've been at it for a while and there's a reason why they are the greatest freelance network in the world. So check out fiverr.com and receive 10% off your first order by using my specific code TWIST, T-W-I-S-T. This week in startups, it's like our little hashtag. Find all the digital services you need in one place. F-I-V-E-R-R.com slash twist and use that promo code twist to get 10% off your first order. Again, fiverr.com code twist. All right, George Arison is with us. He created Taxi Magic, uh, was co-founder there and then a co-CEO and founder of Shift, which is shift.com and they're buying up cars. They'll give you a decent price uh, and sell it uh, and let you, if you want to buy a car, do a test drive in your home. So if we were selling this like, you know, $10,000 use Prius. Um, and I'm the person who wants to sell it. I s and let's say somebody would buy it for 10,000. Yep. I sell it to you for what? Yeah, so we will probably offer you somewhere between 8,000 and $8,500. Okay, um, kind of depending on how much reconditioning that car requires. Got it. Uh, so I sell we'll, it to you for 8250. Yep. And then we'll turn it around and, uh, and sell it for 10. Uh, maybe a little bit more because normally private party prices. So what a buyer buys a car from mm -hmm. another individual are lower versus what Got they it. buy from a dealer now. Because they haggle. Yeah, well, not just haggle, but also just the trust level, right? Like with us, there's a higher level of trust. Got it. Uh, people kind of, tr uh, you know, buy, pay for the experience they're getting. Uh, that said, like our prices are generally somewhere in the range of, you know, 95 to 98% to market list. Because mm. everybody lists and you can kind of see where the list prices are. And then everybody reduces the price from the list price during haggling. Mm -hmm. We don't haggle. We are one price. but we kind of know where everyone else comes out. Um, CarMax, on the other hand, sells at like 102 to 104 percent to market. Got it. Um, so everyone thinks they're getting a really great deal at CarMax, but they really are not because they actually overpaying. Um, but our prices are meant to be a little bit above the private party price because you are getting a special experience, and ultimately you got to pay for it. Right, and so well, like the concierge bringing the car to you is Correct. just an amazing innovation. So what about having to then um, in this model? You have to clean the car, get it inspected. You yep. do work on the car to make it better. We do do you that. change the tires. So, we do all what that. do you typically spend? You know, rehabbing or pre or prepping. I guess would be the way to think about it. Prepping the car for sale. Total. So this is all public um, in our yeah. financials. Uh, we've released that. We're, right now, we're kind of uh, on average in the eleven hundred dollars per car uh, in terms of reconditioning spend. Got it. Um, we want new, not what we we will be getting that down to about you know age fifty. Uh, over the next three years, that's sort of the goal. Um, mm. Ideally, that's the number you're at. Part of the challenge for us is that we are California-based and the costs in California are a lot higher than in a lot of our places. And so as you expand into other parts of the country, um, you know, your cost base on reconditioning will come down. That's yeah. probably the single biggest sort of, you know, this whole business was built on a test and learn model because at Taxi Metric, we didn't do test and learn. We thought we knew what the product was and then we just kind of build it. Yeah. Here, we've done the exact opposite. Like, let's oh. do it one at a time. I did not think we'd be doing reconditioning. If you had asked me in 2010 you know, or 11, uh, when I was starting to think about this first, like, you know, you'll have all these mechanics working for you. I'd be like, you're completely crazy. That's not what I want to do. But you kind of learn that if you don't do reconditioning, consumers don't buy the product. Ah. Uh, people really want that trust and faith in, in, the, in the reconditioning of the car. And, and so we have to have our own reconditioning capabilities. And it's a huge competitive advantage. Uh, to do it really well. One of the things we figured out about 18 months ago is that we were over reconditioning cars that were older than eight years old or that had more than 80,000 miles on them. So we actually- You were doing created, unnecessary reconditioning. Because yeah, uh, we were trying to get them to like near new level, but it turns out the people who buy those types of cars actually don't care about that. Yeah, they're they trying to save money. They're, they're yeah, not they're, interested they, in this. They, they want to get a safe car, but they don't need it to look really great. So we actually changed our reconditioning standards, created a segment we call value. So it's a cheaper segment, uh, reduced our reconditioning costs, which dramatically helped our unit economics because now we're spending less money doing reconditioning. Um, and the cars still sell really well and consumer feedback's really positive. So uh, it's been a really interesting experience, but it's a way more operational business than I initially thought I'd be creating. I thought it was going to be like software only, <laughs> no kind of people involved. But, you know, it turns out you actually need a lot of people to do this. And, and so this idea of testing and iterating as a founder, where else have you done that in this process? 
Well, across the board, you know, delivering, just to start with, initially the thinking was, um, you, Jason, have a car to sell. We will come in like Airbnb and help you sell the car by yeah. helping you list, um, having a warranty on the car, maybe helping you sell a loan to a buyer as well. But yeah. you would actually keep the car and do the sale on your own. We started to do that in 2013, 2014. And the feedback we got from consumers was, hey, actually, this process is so difficult. Why don't you just take the car away from me and sell it for me? Mm. And the fact that people were like asking us to do that uh, was a huge impetus to kind of taking cars away and, and storing them on our own. Um, I would not have done that had it not been very direct kind of user feedback to do uh, to do it this way. Um, the, it turned out people just don't want the headache. They just want you to exactly. handle everything. They do it on their own because they don't have a better way of doing it. But mm. when you offer them a better way to do it without losing too much money, they're very willing to take on a, an alternative. Got it. And what cars are the most popular today? Which ones hold their resale value the most? Which ones are the most in demand? I'm just curious from a fr from a make and model perspective, wh well, where it, are the, it, it where the businesses? Yeah. So it all depends on where you are. I mean, for us in the Bay Area in particular, um, BMWs do extremely well. Subarus do very well. Um, Priuses do extremely well as well. But it really depends on the market. And uh, probably our consumer base is not necessarily the same as the consumer base across the entire region that we might be in, whether it's Bay Area, LA, Portland, or anywhere else, uh, because we appeal more to a millennial customer. You know, almost half of our users are millennials. Um, so we appeal to younger users who want to do a technology solution. That said, you know, what we noticed post uh, lockdowns or right around lockdowns is that uh, the demand for cheaper vehicles uh, rose dramatically. Um, so w through August uh, year to date, our d the demand on our um, value cars, so these are cars that are over 80,000 miles or over eight years in age, um, was massive. 29% uh, of the cars we sold were value. When steady state, our expectation was it'd be closer to like 20%, uh, so almost 50% more value sales than we had expected because people in a recessionary environment want to pay less for a car, right? So, which makes kind of sense when you think about it. Um, and so uh, it all kind of depends on time of year, where you are, et cetera. Um, but generally speaking, uh, foreign vehicles hold their value a lot better um, versus domestic cars. And we do a lot better with, you know, Japanese vehicles, et cetera, than we do with uh, US makes. So tell me about the decision to do a SPAC and where you're at in that process. So we're very close to being done. Um, on uh, uh, Thursday last week, uh, the SEC approved our S4, uh, and the shareholder vote for the SPAC is set on October 13th. Um, so we're you know, nearly at, at the finish line, which is exciting. Uh, we, uh, I have known about SPACs for about a year. Um, la last year, around this time of year, uh, one of my board members, Manish Patel, uh, sent me a deck uh, about SPACs. And he's like, hey, you might want to learn about this because it mm. might be an interesting option for us long term. Yeah. Um, so I started to kind of research and learn and then talk to a few SPACs in terms of learning how it all works, um, but didn't kind of put that as, hey, this is the thing we're going to do um, until uh, the pandemic happened. Um, our plan was to raise a regular private round of capital. Uh, in the spring uh, of, of 2020 and then wait for about a year uh, and go public in, you know, the fall of 2021. Uh, that was the intention. Shift, uh, we've always built to be a public company. Um, I'm not one of those like, hey, let's wait to go public. I think uh, this business would actually do better as a public company in, in many ways. Um, and uh, we've always intended to go public. Uh, but, in, you know, as the pandemic hit and we were Right a bit around then, we're thinking through like fundraising and getting our round started. Uh, it became clear that uh, the public markets were holding up a lot better uh, versus the private markets. And, and since our expectation always was to go public within, you know, 12 to 15 months of raising that round, then why not pull the trigger and do it right away? Uh, and especially with uh, Carvana, which is an analog company to us, doing so well in the public markets, uh, that actually made it even more appealing. And then lastly, we saw the public markets kind of split into winners and losers, and winners were e-commerce e businesses. Um, and so that also you know, made us think like, hey, going public sooner makes a lot of sense. And then if you want to go public sooner, um, and you're a little bit smaller in size, 
um, versus the ideal kind of public size, a SPAC is a really great option uh, to, to go public. It allows you to get the process done really fast, um, and, and it allows you to raise more capital, which is also advantageous uh, in our case. Yeah, and I, and I see Carvana is now at a $38 billion yeah. market cap with uh, looks like $4 billion in sales last year. Who knows what they'll hit this year, but you would assume Only it's somewhere growing. between 6 and 8 is what I would guess. Yeah, oh, wow. So growing 50% is, is pretty impressive. They've done uh, over 100% growth every year so far since they've been public. It's been really incredible. Wow. Uh, and then wh what's your revenue footprint now? We'll do 200 million this year, uh, and Fine. then we'll do 400 million next year. Amazing. So uh, you'll be going public. And then what I want to know is um, when you do these uh, SPACs, do you also do a pipe, a private investment yep. in a public entity? Answer that question when we get back on this week at Startups. If you want to learn from the greatest minds in the world, where do you go? Say it with me, everybody, masterclass.com slash startups. That's right, masterclass.com slash startups to get 15% off your annual membership. And this is the amazing thing about Masterclass. They have this beautiful yearly annual subscription. It's so affordable and you get everything. Thomas Keller or Gordon Ramsay, Steph Curry on three-point shooting, Martin Scorsese, Mr. Scorsese is on there to teach you how to make movies. I can't believe the level of talent they get at Masterclass. Over 85 classes from a wide range of world-class instructors. That thing you've always wanted to learn is now closer than you think. And it's really entertaining. Our head of partnerships, Matt, has been jamming with music lessons from Carlos Santana. Amazing. Herbie Hancock and Sheila E. He can't stop raving about taking lessons from legends like these. I highly recommend you go check it out. The barbecue as well up there, my favorite. You can get unlimited access to every masterclass. This is the brilliance. Lifelong learning is the future. Self-paced learning is the future. And high production value and entertainment is the future. And the future is masterclass. It is an amazing, amazing company. I want you to go right now to Masterclass dot com slash startups to get 15% off your annual membership. That's a really great offer. So go ahead and go there right now. My listeners for a limited time, 15% off masterclass at masterclass.com slash startups. It's just really amazing. And it's great to see that startup do exceptionally well. Uh, congratulations to the team at masterclass masterclass.com slash startups. Hey, welcome back, everybody. George Arison is our uh, guest today on this week in startups. You can follow him on Twitter, George a r i s o n he's on twitter i'm not sure how active he is not um, very active but I'm not very active busy uh actually running a business as opposed to having twitter derangement syndrome uh <laughs> and being distracted um as part of the spac that entity gives you some money yep um and the entity is already trading so you don't have this market manipulation i guess would be the most cynical look at the traditional IPO process, you basically don't leave money on the table because they underprice your shares. Um, but then there's been this debate of if you, if you should do a pipe, which is a private investment in a public entity. Obviously, the pipe um, is something Bill Gurley maybe wasn't uh, interested in, or he had his position was he wrote this blog post saying you shouldn't do a pipe. And that, Why? That, what was his reason for that? What uh, I think it's partly the underpricing because the pipe ah. creates a possibility of underpricing. But the reality is you actually should absolutely do, do a pipe. SPACs have uh, kind of like on a second, uh, second wind now. They, you know, they were popular, became unpopular, and now they're popular again. And a big reason for them becoming popular is actually the pipe. Um, because previously what would happen is that the SPAC sponsor and the company would agree to a crazy valuation. Um, become merge, and then all the shareholders in the SPAC would be like, "Hey, this valuation doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, we don't like it, and the price would come down, and everyone was mm. unhappy." Uh, the pipe allows for a validation of the price because you go out to a smaller set of public market investors, uh, you pitch them the business, and they come back to you with, "Yes, this makes sense," or "It doesn't." And if they say yes, then um, they invest. Um, and that kind of validates the price for the overall public market, which is really beneficial. The other thing is, is that most but people- But you who, could underprice. So you could, because you could you're negotiating that price, if you say, hey, $10 a share, 
it could you could come out and all of a sudden it pops of twenty. Yes. And and it happens a lot. I mean, our our share price has ranged from twelve to fourteen um, since we've been since we announced the deal. Uh, second reason you need to do a, a pipe is that uh, most people who invest in a SPAC IPO when a SPAC goes public mm-hmm. are actually uh, hedge funds that are looking for special situation deals. So they're not people who are long term holders of the business uh, once the merger is complete. And so a really good DSPAC process of you actually kind of finishing the merger involves those shareholders selling their ownership to people you actually want to have as your long- long-term holders. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, for someone like an open door or, or us, like a T. Rowe Price, for example, is a great holder, right? We want that investor, not a hedge fund that's kind of there for the short term. Uh, and so, we, what so you do the, is- Just so I understand here, the hedge funds are backing all these SPACs because- the SPAC has a 12 to 30 month window to do a transaction, and then they just want to get out of it. And Correct. so they have this 24 month window, let's call it 18 month window, where they're hoping to double their money or go up 50% yeah, or 25%. Not, not, yeah, not even double, probably like 20, 25%. Because it's Got it. you, you invest money, you think you'll kind of sell it like, you know, 12, 13, $14, you invest at 10. And then you also get a warrant. Uh, in, ah. For every share you buy initially at eleven fifty, so the assumption is that if a share price eventually is performing at above eleven fifty, you you will you know use that warrant to buy into it, and you'll make some money ah. on that as well. So you basically have this option with this uh, warrant at eleven fifty. So if you were to sell all your shares and make that twenty five percent return, that would be twelve and a half percent a year or something like that. Yep. Um, call it uh, or ten percent a year, whatever. Okay, that feels pretty good. But then you also have this lottery ticket over here. Hey, what if the company goes to fifty dollars a share? You have exactly. the warrant, and how long do you have typically on the warrant to execute it? I don't know how long, but it's pretty long. It's over yeah. a couple of years, so it's there for oh, that's a while. nice. That's so that's a nice little yum yum. If it does hit, you get this other uh, you know nice uh, hit. And also, when you do the pipe, the the SPAC promoter in the case of Chamath or Mark Pincus yep. or Emil Michaels doing one former uh, business development exec at. Uh, uh, Uber, um, they get 20% carry basically or promote it's on the money to, they put in? It's between 20 and 30%, but that's into the, it's not a, into the money they put in. So when a, when a SPAC is issued, it's a, let's just use round numbers, it's a $200 million SPAC, there will be, so you'll issue 20 million shares at $10 a share, there'll be another 60 million shares issued to mm. the sponsor that did the deal. Got so it. that, you know, that's 60 could be 40 on the low end, 60 on the high end. Mm-hmm. So the actual valuation of a $200 million SPAC is $260 million. That's what mer- merges with a private company. The pipe comes in on top of that. So it's an additional de- mm. set of dilution. But the pipe, like I said, one validates the valuation. Number two, it allows you to raise additional capital. And number three, you want to do a pipe where you have interest in a lot more money than you actually sell in the pipe. And then a lot of those shareholders or in potential buyers run out and buy money, uh, buy equity in the company in the public market, mm. right? So they become holders of the SPAC itself instead of the hedge funds, which then ensures you have longer term holders, which is what you want. So Pipe is actually a really critical part of the instruments here that you need to use uh, to be successful. And raising the SPAC itself is easy. The really hard stuff is the execution. And so mm. I think we work with a uh, team, um, the, the Cohens, Betsy and, and Daniel Cohen. They're a very you know, prominent SPAC issue. They've done many of these. I think it's been really awesome for us to have that support because the execution here is really uh, important and really critical. So a lot of folks are getting into the SPAC business, but m- many of them don't actually know what the process is like in the on the D SPAC. Uh, mm. and, and that's where, you know, if a founder is looking at a SPAC, kind of getting the right folks who know how to D SPAC a business is, is really important. And how important is the promoter in terms of, you know, you've got somebody, good friend of mine, Chamath, who's doing these. He's obviously very eloquent, well spoken, yep. incredible track record. Then I'm seeing some people maybe you know, maybe they were, you know, famous in the 80s or 90s, yep. and they're kind of retired and feels to me like they're trying to get one more hit or <laughs> one more payday when they're, yeah. I you think uh, the promoter is important. Um, there's two kinds of promoters, though, right? There is the one who is like appealing really well to a retail investor, which mm-hmm. is an example of that. But then, you know, a, a retired senior executive 
uh, at a public company will probably have a lot of respect from more institutional investors, uh, and that can work really well as well. So mm -hmm. I think kind of both sides make a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, I think repeat issuers, so people who've issued many SPACs, uh, work really well, uh, and or people who've been through the process already. So, you know, CEOs or founders of companies that have gone through a SPAC um, are, are also a really good place to look. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Paul Ryan uh, just raised a SPAC, but uh, the pr CEO of that SPAC actually led a, a SPAC company that became public through a SPAC a year ago. So that type of group of people is also really good. Well, what is the reaction by, if you know it, um, the traditional IPO process to this spectacular speculation that we've seen oh. recently? Are th did they come to you and say, hey, hey, pump the brakes, we want to take you out? No, banks love SPACs because banks actually make more fees in SPACs than they do in... Uh, how, in how? Uh, really? So, yeah, because you, um, they, they issue... So many banks issue SPACs and they raise money, they get money from that as a typical IPO uh, mm -hmm. payment to them. And then if they represent a company in merging with a SPAC, they mm -hmm. collect M&A fees on that. Got it. So they get the M&A fees as opposed to the green shoe or exactly. whatever. So, so they do really well. I mean, there's a lot of positives about a SPAC. Speed, the amount of money you raise um, are, are two really big ones. But the negative is that the bank fees are actually higher. Um, and the legal fees are higher as well because you're paying oh. two lawyers, right? The SPAC lawyers and your lawyers have to be paid uh, on both sides. Uh, and so there's a little bit more fees that you have to deal with in, in this type of transaction. So famously, I guess in 1996, we had 8,000 public companies and now we're, you know, whatever, 4,000. This has been kind of crazy that yep. people don't want to go public. And I know that a lot of founders are coming to you from growth companies and saying, hey, what's your experience? Yep. Um, I guess a two-part question here, what do you think the world looks like in three or four years if we assume the spectacular speculation continues? Um, and I, I, I see no reason why it wouldn't. Yep. But what does the world look like for you know venture capital, angel investors, CEOs, and public markets and retail investors? Let's pick five years from now. I think SPACs are here to stay. I think you're going to have a lot more companies using that method to go public. SPACs are especially good for companies in the kind of half a billion to $2 billion uh, enterprise value range, mm -hmm. right? Not for the, like Airbnb doing a SPAC makes no sense. <laughs> Let's put why it that, is that way. It's just uh, why you, you, they can easily go public on their own uh, without a SPAC. Uh, they, and they don't have this issue of time that, hey, I might need to go public sooner, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and so I think... For companies over two, three billion dollars, specs don't make as much sense. Specs are ideal for kind of the the smaller companies um, because the best team at Goldman and and Morgan Stanley is going to take Airbnb public. You we will not necessarily get that level of institutional support if you are a one billion or two billion dollar company, right? And that that's also critical. Um, and so I think specs are here to stay. I think that we had a little bit of an aberration where. There was so much money in the private markets. Uh, everybody was kind of staying private for a long time. Yeah, that's changing, and I think it's going to long-term change because it makes more sense to have companies that are six, seven, eight years old be public rather than private. It'd be much better for me, like and for I, everybody I, I, else. I think. Well, I'm just concerned with myself, to be totally honest. George is. <laughs> I mean, I had to wait like 10, 11 years for Uber to go public, and I'm, I'm being slightly facetious here. But I, for somebody who invests when the company is. $5 million. That's when I invested in Uber, Com, and Thumbtack yep. at a valuation of $15 million, George, combined. They were 4 or $5 million each. Yum, yum. But, you know, the amount of time between when, like, Thumbtack, Uber, Data Stacks, um, I invested in all those companies at the same time, and only one of them is public right now. And can you imagine how quickly I could have returned money into the seed stage? an angel phase, if I could have been more liquid, you know, and, and gotten yeah. liquid earlier, this would, this is going to have an effect, I believe, on entrepreneurship in the United States, that is going to be wicked. Because, man, if, if Robinhood was public right now, or Calm was public right now, man, yum, yum, I would be out there doing twice as many angel investments, but my, my velocity would go up. Yep. But I, I'm sitting here holding and waiting, you know, no, um, I think it, you know, I know I've been of the mind going public sooner is, is better. Uh, and uh, I'm generally think companies Why? have to stay public. Uh, because A, I don't, look, for me, building a company needs to get to success, right? And I don't think another fund marking up 
an older fund is really success yet. Uh, that's something I've been telling my team a lot, like raising money does not equal success. Being public, uh, especially for a while, that's kind of like recognition from a much broader market that you've actually succeeded and built something that can stay there for a long time. Mm. Uh, so that's to me really important. I mean, that's why I like to build is to kind of get to a certain destination. And, yeah. and for us, this is a really big destination. I mean, frankly, like it, I still, I still haven't fully cognized the fact that seven years ago we were working in my tiny apartment in San Francisco in our, you yeah. know, on my kind of li- in my living room. Um, and that now we're going to be a public company that's still like not fully cognizant, but it's happening. Um, well, and, it's a uh, big deal, right? Like f- for our generation, Gen Xers, getting to run a public company was an incredible goal, an incredible sign of success. And so you carry that with you. Dave Friedberg's an investor, a good friend of mine. Yep. In the All In Podcast. Was he an angel or just early on? Or he was a, he's an angel. He actually helped uh, me figure out the whole warranty thing really well because he knows insurance, obviously. Yes. Uh, quite well. so. Wow. Congrats on that. He's a great human being. Obviously, very smart. I have a question for you. As somebody from the former Soviet Union, and you look at America today, and you see a contingent of people, I put it in the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, New York Times... Uh, anti-capitalist, ban the billionaires, capitalism is bad, Uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon are horrible because they're successful. When you look at this as somebody coming from Russia who had to fight for every inch of your existence, I am certain, to get here, and your father, the maniac he was, demanding you learn English to have a better life, what do you think when you look at the last couple of years and the anti-capitalism, the pro-socialism, ban the billionaires movement in America, even though I know it's a small contingent. What do you think, honestly, as somebody from Georgia and the firm or server USSR, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think Bernie Sanders is nuts, uh, even though I went to college in Vermont. And well, I guess maybe because I went to college in Vermont, I knew about Bernie Sanders before anybody else knew about Bernie right. Sanders. Uh, look, America is the most amazing place in the world. Nowhere else w- could you do what I did, right? Like I'm a Gay kid born in the Soviet Union. I now live in Palo Alto with a husband and two children and, and, and built uh, two companies in my life. That's not possible anywhere else. This is the most amazing experiment in the history of mankind. And we have to do everything we can to protect it because uh, we've been left by our forefathers with an incredible gift. And uh, we need to ensure that it's there for the future generations. And I don't think that uh, going the socialist route, socialism route kind of helps you do that. Uh, I think capitalism and Republican government are very intertwined. Um, free trade is obviously critical to that as well. And I love politics uh, in part because I want to make sure that uh, our system of government perpetuates because it is the mm-hmm. most incredible system of government we've ever um, had before. Wait, when you look at you know, sort of the interference from the Russians and Putin specifically. What, what is he sitting there laughing at us that he's been able to find our two weaknesses? I mean, really, if you think about America's weaknesses, uh, one is the, the terrible uh, racial history of this country and the scar we have from slavery, our original sin here, and uh, the indigenous people here getting rolled over and taking their land. That is one really sore spot that we need to resolve. And then you have the second sore spot, which is the polarization of wealth, which, you know, if you're in Russia, you know, if if you get wealthy, (laughs) Putin just takes half your money. Or you run away. Or you run. (laughs) So when you when you look at his interfering here and the and the and the the collapse, essentially, Russia is becoming irrelevant, oil is becoming irrelevant. What are your thoughts on the, the interference and how America has basically fallen for this hook, line, and sinker? Well, he's been, or Russians have been interfering in elections in its neighboring countries forever, right? In Georgia, they interfere all the time. In the Baltics, they try to interfere all the time. So it's not per se like surprising that Russia interferes in elections. I think we've let him kind of do it. Uh, I think there's a problem in both parties, frankly, that we can't really talk to each other about uh, some fundamental issues. I mean, politics should should end at the water's edge and, and we should be able to uh, have a unified foreign policy, right? Even if we disagree on what the approach should be. Uh, and we've been, you know, making mistakes on that front for a long time. And I, I'm kind of the mind that, you know, this election is going to be what it is, but ultimately, um, both political parties, uh, especially younger people in both political parties, have to step up and and figure out what we're going to do about governing ourselves in a better way. Because what we've been doing for the last, you know, twelve to fifteen, twenty years is not really working. And by the way, it's not about like oh things are going to be bad in the United States. 
if things are bad in the United States, things are going to be really crappy everywhere else in the world. Um, and See, so- this is a very important observation for young people listening to this podcast who are entitled and have been coddled in America their entire lives, which is, if America is not exceptional, and we're exceptional through capitalism and through creating products, that's how we are exceptional in the world, is the freedoms we have to create the world's dominant companies that spread around the world, whether it's Google or Uber or Tesla. We need these companies. We need to lead economically. And we need to lead on human rights uh, and, and on having a just system here. And if we don't, well, then despots and, you know, whether it's MBS in Saudi Arabia or Xi Jinping in China or Putin in Russia or the Kim Jongs in North Korea, this is bad for humanity yep. and human rights globally. Yep. And generally speaking, when a you know, world system that's kind of running well falls apart. It's usually followed by centuries of mass kind of chaos for the world. Yeah. And that's really bad. So I think that uh, we have a lot of obligations uh, to the world and to ourselves and to our children, right? So yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, but that said, I'm super hopeful, right? Like we uh, figure things out uh, in America. And when we do, uh, we tend to do them really, really well. Uh, and I'm very confident that we'll do this uh, in this case as well. I, you know what? I'm super confident because people like you come to this country and you call yourself American. That's how you identify. You could say I'm Georgian. You got a little bit of an accent there, but you speak English perfectly and you consider yourself an American. And when, when I grew up, we were told this is the melting pot. Mm -hmm. Forget about this like identity politics nonsense. Like we said we're Americans. We meld together. We take all of the different ingredients around the world and we make this beautiful stew. And they literally, in our schools, indoctrinated us to a stew. And they showed a stew with all these different ingredients going yep. in. And they said, this is what makes us strong. Not what makes us different, but what makes us come together. And you consider yourself American. That's an honor for American to have a great entrepreneur come here and identify as American. That's what we need to preserve is that you or Elon Musk or Steve Jobs' father keeps coming to America and seeing this as the promised land. Thank you so much for coming on the pod. You've been an amazing guest. Awesome. Thank you very much. I wish you continued success and uh, we will see you all next time on this week's service. Bye-bye.